G'day everyone and welcome back to this Share Cafe Hidden Gems uh, series. Um, nothing from me today, I know that's hard to believe, other than we are starting a, a new webinar series just for one company. Um, that's gonna be called Due Diligence. Uh, it's gonna be over Tuesday lunchtime. Um, it'll be a 45 minute single company presentation uh, and then followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. And that's gonna be pitched more towards the professional investor end. So watch out for that. That will be on a Tuesday lunchtime. Um, first up today, we have WT Financial Group, ASX code WTL, market cap around 27 million, one year return of up 113%. The company is a diversified financial services company. Its advice and product offerings are delivered primarily through a group of independent financial advisors operating as authorised reps under Wealth Today and the Century Dealer Group Operations. It has around 275 advisors. It also offers, uh, uh, operates a direct-to-consumer operation under its Spring Financial Group brand. We have with us Keith Cullen, who is both the founder and managing director. Welcome back, Keith. Over to you, Thank mate. Yeah, thanks very much, Tim. <clears throat> and thanks, everybody, for joining us today. As Tim says, my name's Keith Cullen. Uh, I'm the founder and MD of WTL. Uh, today, I'm going to give you a bit of background on the company and talk about our uh, recent acquisition of our industry peer, Sentry Group, and then take you through a little of what's happening in the financial advice industry in Australia today, uh, the disruption that we're seeing in the industry and how that represents a great opportunity for company like our, companies like ours. So I'll just get you to pop through those first couple of disclaimer slides for us and on, on to, um, there we go. Our first one, so about WTL, we were originally founded under the name of Spring Financial Group in 2010. And initially our focus was on delivering a range of financial services direct to consumers under our Spring Financial Group brand. So really a B2C operation where all of our advisors were salaried advisors. And look, we enjoyed great success uh, initially, uh, profitable from our first year. Uh, we built a terrific range of assets and intellectual property uh, focused on advisor education and training on consumer education and client recruitment and digital marketing processes and a real process driven advice creation and risk management framework. So terrific assets, uh, high growth. We listed on the ASX initially under the code of SFL in 2015, listing under the profits test. And we had a really strong dividend history paying out around 7 million in dividends across our first couple of years. But then fast forward to 2017 and really significant changes to legislation and regulations and to education standards culminating in the Royal Commission all impacted considerably, not just on the industry broadly, but very much on the company as well. And it forced us to have a real rethink. So the board and shareholders determined that it was best to bite the bullet and shift our thinking from being a primarily a B2B, a B2C operator to uh, really focusing on business to business. And we thought that would enable us to leverage all of those assets that we built within our B2C business and offer those out to independent financial advisors, which is where we saw that the opportunity was going to sit uh, into the future. And so that strategy saw us dispose of a number of our B2C assets and really scale back a lot of our fixed overheads. That program of scaling back those fixed overheads has really just been completed in the last several months as we've run, it, run off the leases on a number of our B2C um, uh, 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 buildings and, and uh, office accommodation, et cetera. Central to our shift to B2B was our acquisition in 2018 of Wealth Today. And Wealth Today comprises um, a, a group, of, or when we acquired it, it, it comprised a group of what was then about 40 independent financial advisors. And we were providing them a comprehensive range of services, uh, compliance, education and training, tech support, practice management and business development, et cetera. And the real driver to that was that we saw in the wake of the Royal Commission that there was a quick unravelling of the traditional vertically integrated model where banks had bought up all of the dealer groups to aid their distribution of their products. So we really what we did with this shift was we turned what was industry disruption on the company on its head. And, and instead of it being a burden to us, as we've been capitalising on it. 
So leveraging all of those assets as we organically grew wealth today to around 120 advisors across 105 practices, and we've significantly grown that further if we pop onto the next slide now, please, with our acquisition of our industry peer Sentry Group. So Sentry had been operating for more than a decade. Um, it, it, it had built to a position of around 155 advisors across around 100 practices. And so a pretty significant operation, bringing it together with us now as we're sitting with around 275 advisors across 200 practices. Uh, we acquired Sentry for an initial payment of $7 million. There could be a further back-end payment of $3 million. I certainly hope there is because it's a performance-based payment that will be relative to um, Sentry hitting certain milestones. Um, we satisfied the uh, acquisition payment 50% uh, shares and 50% cash with those vendor shares all being uh, escrowed for a period of two years. We also raised an additional $1.5 million of cash at the time to fund not only transaction costs, but also integration costs. And that acquisition settled in July. Um, look, the key to the acquisition is not only the complementary nature of the two businesses, but also operational efficiencies. And we've already implemented significant cost reductions from those synergies, and there's some more potential savings to go. And the acquisition's very been very accretive to earnings. It's it's um, taken us straight into uh, into profitability. Uh, the integration of systems and processes across uh, both um, Century Group and, and Wealth Today practices has been very well received by the advisors in both camps. And look, despite the lockdowns presenting some challenges in getting things integrated, we're really pleased at the progress that's been made and the reception that we've had sort of industry-wide, but also across the uh, existing advisor cohorts. So I think it's fair to say that the execution risk on the integration of the operations has been met. We're out the other side of that and the executive and the operational teams have dealt with it very well, you know, particularly under these lockdown circumstances. So. Of course, we've been in discussions for Century, with Sentry for some time. And after announcing the deal in June, there was a one month delay um, to the settlement while we sought shareholder approval for the issuance of the shares associated with the transaction. So we had a fair bit of time to plan for it and get ready uh, for merging the operations. So I'll just pop through to the next slide now. It really is a very complementary and transformational acquisition for us. Um, the board and management team has been uh, expanded greatly. And uh, look, I've got some slides in here today that, uh, that talk to the board and management team, but we've announced these and, and I'd urge everyone to have a look at our previous announcements to get a good feeling for just the terrific experience that both the executive team and also uh, the people that have joined our board associated with the transaction have uh, brought to the table. I think really for Century, it was a sell in rather than a sell out um, uh, of their operations. And so uh, from that perspective, it's been viewed more as a merger and we've really been able to broaden not just the advisor base and revenue and profitability, but also the executive team and, and, uh, and, the, and the board as well. So we'll just pop through to the next slide. Um, oh, we'll skip that one, I think. Yeah, good one. Just having a look at the sort of shape of where this places us now and what's happening in the industry. This is that rotation that I talked about of the sort of disintegration of the vertically integrated model. You see NAB and CBA and Westpac and ANZ have really all exited the industry down to zero. AMP and IOOF remain the two big of the original big six that are there still with that vertically integrated model. And these numbers on the right hand side of that slide sort of show where we're now placed in terms of, um, in terms of our peers. You'll see sort of around us are a number of both listed peers in the likes of Sequoia and Centerpoint Alliance, as well as Count Plus and Eastern. Um, and, and you'll see that there's some privately held peers there as well in, in synchronized or otherwise known as Synchron, Capstone, Lifespan, uh, Fortnum, et cetera. So there's certainly opportunity for considerable organic growth still as these leading independents ourselves included keep, keep growing, but there's definitely transactional opportunities existing in the market not just within this sort of top tiered group, but also well below it as, as the minor groups really start to struggle with, um, I, I'd say anyone under 100 advisors now is really struggling from a scale perspective, given what financial advisors are demanding of their dealer groups in this much more 
complex regulatory and educational environment that we're in now. So uh, if we flip on to the next slide, um, people will ask, why would you be investing in financial uh, advice at a time when the industry's had so much disruption? The reality of that is that the demand for advice is growing. So whilst there's significant challenges in the industry from an operator's perspective, the consumer demand for ad advice really makes this an incredibly exciting time to be investing in the industry. Uh, for companies like ours, as consolidations happening, as, as demands on advisors are increasing and they need more from their dealer groups. Central to this is we're right on the doorstep of the biggest wealth transfer uh, in the history of this country with about $3 trillion about to transfer from one generation to the next, uh, really increasing that demand for advice. So we'll flip onto the next slide. It's a couple of slides here. Michael Harrison's joined us, Rob Jones has joined us. Both of these gentlemen came to us from Century. Um, they've both been involved in, in the old shad forts that sold into IOOF, considerable merger and acquisition opportunity. Flip onto the next slide. And our management team's been uh, complimented. Our new head of finance and, and our, our new joint COO, David Newman and Rickton Jones, uh, joining our Frank Paul and Jack Standing to really round out our executive team. And the, the next slide, and I think that'll get us close. Uh, quickly wrapping up before Q&A, it's some key things from a financial perspective is we're, we're targeting $70 million in gross revenue for the year, might be a bit more than that. And, uh, and our, our net profit after tax guidance is for, um, you know, in excess of $2 million. Uh, that'll be an accounting profit. Uh, we've got tax losses to use up. So we're really looking forward to being able to deliver for shareholders this year um, and, and drive some growth. Critically, we cleaned up the balance sheet significantly at June 30. And so we're really well positioned to deliver those numbers. There you go, Tim. I think that was about on 10 minutes. Right. I reckon that was bang straight on 10 minutes. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> Good on you. Um, can you talk a little about your, your growth prospects? Um, is the idea to increase the net the, the revenue per advisor? And, and how do you balance that with, with acquisitions as well? Yeah, really good question. I mean, I think key to increasing the revenue per advisor is making the advisors more sticky. And it's certainly something that we're very good at within our business from all our B2C experience. I will note we've retained our, our, our the core of our B2C operations. And I think this important point of difference for us is we call it our research and development lab. It really enables us to retain within our DNA what it means to be sitting in front of clients every day. So we don't need to theorise what the impacts of changes to regulation or legislation or product opportunities are in terms of the direct to consumer piece. We live it every day. And so we're very focused to help our advisors drive their, their overall revenue. The reality of that is that has less of an impact on our net profit position because most of our fees are made up of a fixed component that advisors pay us with only a smaller component made up of participating in their variable. But it's, um, a, but it's an important value add to the advisors is really helping them be profitable and strong. And, and is, is the, the real key driver acquisitions? Look, I think it's twofold, Tim. You know, the, the driver to margin is definitely incremental growth through um, uh, through attracting new practices uh, into what we're doing. And in that regard, I'm pleased to say we've really built best of breed for uh, advisors. You know, the bringing together of what Sentry had from its practice management and practice development um, programs that was running with our really tailored risk management framework that makes advisors be able to be very compliant um, in a much more commercialised manner is really offering best of breed out there to advisors and we're attracting practices because of it. But there's definitely acquisition opportunities, smaller ones that are good bolt-ons that come without much, much cost structure to them. And there's definitely some larger opportunities out there as well. Um, there's a question here. What, what debt does, the, does uh, the WT Financial Group have at the moment? Yeah, good question. We've got around $3 million in, 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 uh, in debt in total, and, and we're comfortably dealing with that with both a pretty aggressive amortisation program that's paying it down and, and also comfortably servicing it out of cash flow. Uh, another question here. There seems to be a lot of one-man bands in kind of financial planning businesses. Are, are you worried they'll kind of leave, leave the, the industry altogether? Yeah, I'm not really. I mean, I know a, a number of the larger operators kind of have this negative view towards financial planners that are operating, 
you know, out of serviced offices as a, as a one, two or three man band, but there's a real place for them in the market. And we're really comfortable supporting them. What we've seen is a lot of advisors exit the industry over the last couple of years that really were doing it as an adjunct to another business or, you know, they were semi-retired having sold off a part of their business and they've not wanted to deal with the change to the, the education requirements and so on. But I think most of that, most of that has sort of shaken out now. Um, and so I think that the industry will be pretty stable now. It's more about getting some new young blood into the industry as well. And, um, but we're comfortable supporting the smaller operators. They really need the sorts of framework that we can offer. And, and can you talk through, you, you raised some capital obviously to buy a century. Can you talk through who the new institutional investors are? And can you talk to your, your, your own ownership in, in WT Financial and also uh, other, other management within the group? Yeah, sure. Good question. Well, I think it's a really important point for any small or micro cap company like ours is how much skin in the game do the board and management have? And in this regard, board holdings are around uh, around 26% of the company. Um, in, and then there's an additional 10% held by executives of the company. So you've got board and management holding, you know, well over a third or just over a third of the company, which is fantastic. We've then got institutional shareholders holding about 35% of the company, and then the balance is held by retail investors. We've got around 500 shareholders in the company. This last transaction was backed by existing shareholders that were on the register, which was Ariadne uh, Limited, an, an institutional shareholder. We also had Glennon Capital uh, come into the transaction. Um, and, and then we had a new shareholder come on, which is Summers Limited, um, and Summers Limited, a sort of a major holder in um, uh, major holder in in uh, what was Home Loans Limited, which is now Resimac. They've got about you know fifty percent of that, and and many billions of dollars under management. So it's a really good, strong institutional register that we're building, and great support we've seen from them. Uh, we also had some of our longer term shareholders back us. Um, and we've got uh, McCaff micro, micro cap fund on the register as well. So it's, it's a good mix of Insta, retail and, and board and, and management. Great, Keith. Um, we'll finish there. Thanks for your time. Enjoy your weekend and uh, we'll hear from you again. Always good to see you, Tim. And thanks everyone for joining us. Cheers. Thanks, Keith. Next up, we have RareX, ASX code REE, -E, market cap of around $43.5 million, one year return of minus 40%. Uh, the company is a specialised company focused on developing rare earth deposits in Australia. We have with us uh, the Managing Director, Jeremy Robinson. Jeremy, thanks for your time. Over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Tim, for the introduction and uh, thanks to Share Cafe for inviting us to present today. Um, as uh, was mentioned, uh, my name is Jeremy Robinson. I'm the Managing Director of uh, RareX. We're a, a rare earth focused company. Uh, we're having some exciting results out at uh, Cummins Range, our rare earth deposit in the Kimberley at the moment. I've just returned from a week up there with our geological team and uh, look, very, very exciting what's going on. And I'll walk you through the story over the next 10 minutes. If we could skip through the next few slides. Yep, that one too. All right, that'll do. So as I mentioned, uh, Cummins Range is our, is our primary asset. Uh, we're located in Australia. Uh, we think we've got a really exciting proposition up there in terms of what's going on in the, the rare earth space and especially in this uh, changing uh, geopolitical environment. We think there's a focus on uh, assets, critical minerals assets in safe Western jurisdictions uh, that aren't welded to um, Chinese supply chains. So what we've been doing over the last 12, well, last 24 months now, we've been going, uh, we've Upgraded our resource uh, significantly at Cummins Range. We're up at, at almost 20 million tonnes at 1.15% TREO and 0.14% niobium oxide. Uh, within that, uh, significantly, is a, a high grade portion, which is uh, what we've been focusing on. We're focusing on this uh, almost 2% TREO core and 0.2% uh, niobium as well. Uh, that was on. I was on the back of the drilling we did uh, last year. We put that resource out mid-year, and we've been drilling since about April this year. Uh, we'll be drilling all the way through to Christmas. Uh, the thrust of the drilling this year was to prove the primary portion of our resource, um, and a lot of people have only focused on the the top hundred meters of this this deposit. We believe this deposit has got great breadth, great depth extents, and we're showing that now with the drill bit. Uh, so this is all in the back, all in the background of an exciting time to be in rare earths. Uh, you've had rare earth prices uh, increase significantly. They've come up from about forty dollars 
a kilo. I'm talking about the NDPR price, which is the main one we track and the main value driver. That's moved from about $40 a kilo up to over $95 a kilo at the moment. And talking to people I talk to in the industry, we're, we're looking at a buoyant industry. We're expecting $120 to $150 a kilo in that, in that pricing scenario over the next couple of years. Uh, last of all, I'll advertise our spin out, Cosmos Exploration. We think we've got an exciting proposition there uh, in terms of focusing on some nickel copper exploration, some, some unknown part of WA. We're looking at Julemar lookalikes, and uh, we'll talk about that last of all. We'll skip. So it's worth touching on the board, and of course, our capital structure. Uh, we're a relatively tight capital structure 450 million shares, uh, 43 million market cap five and a half in cash and shares, so well funded for what we're doing this year. Our board is, is worth mentioning. Uh, our chairman, John Young, um, uh, very successful in the lithium space, was a founder of Pilgrim Minerals with Neil Biddle, and um, where I think we're all uh, aware of what's going on in the lithium space. Uh, our view of rare earths is rare earths is, a, is, is the next cab off the rank. Uh, lithium has just absolutely exploded lately, and uh, we're seeing uh, rare earths play the catch up game there. Worth mentioning Cameron Henry, who's a founder of Primero Group. He's got a lot of uh, processing of industrial minerals experience, uh, done, built a hell of a lot of uh, lithium plants around the world, and has experience in rare earths as well, being involved with the construction phase at uh, Mount World. Recently appointed our general manager projects to drive the scoping study, which we're going to deliver next year. Uh, James Durrant is uh, in charge of that process and is uh, you know, uh, full steam ahead on our scoping study. Next slide. So as I mentioned, rare earth market, uh, why do we like it? Uh, this is all about renewable energy. This is all about growth in EVs and wind power. Uh, I think we're all across the EV story because we're all um, seeing what's happening in the, in the lithium space. But EVs are, are just set to explode. It's happening. Uh, you can't avoid it. it it's, it's here and now. The one you're probably not so much aware of is wind power. Uh, renewable energy, wind power, there are two, two main sources of renewable energy, solar and wind power. And wind power installation is, is growing in leaps and bounds, uh, specifically offshore. People don't want these wind turbines in their backyard, but they don't mind them being out at sea in high wind areas. And those uh, offshore wind turbines are you know, a huge user of rare earths because rare earths are the best source of, uh, they have the highest magnetic properties and you need those magnets to drive the, drive the conversion of wind power into electricity. So there are our two, grain, uh, two main growth markets. It's also used in just about everything you use in your day-to-day -day life. We're talking iPhones, we're talking any sort of robotics you have, probably the windscreen motors in your car, et cetera. So it's in absolutely everything. You can't get away from this. It's a concentrated supply chain at the moment. It's about 80% China, but the West is aggressively inv investing in um, supply chains. And we hope our uh, Cummins range can feed into that. Next slide, please. So as I was talking about, uh, the, the metals we're focused on are neodymium and praseodymium. Uh, dysprosium and terbium are also of interest to us. We have those in minor amounts, but neodymium and praseodymium um, are the main drivers, being a light rare earth project. Our product mix is very similar to that that exists at Mount Weld uh, with Linus. We've got about 20% NDPR. We have about 0.5% dysprosium, about 0.1% terbium. The prices of NDPR are, are currently you know, about $95 a kilo. Uh, fun facts about dysprosium and terbium. Dysprosium is probably trading about $450 a kilo and terbium is about $1,300 a kilo. So while it's only 0.1% in our deposit, it uh, is a significant contributor to the, the value in our deposit. So what we're seeing over this decade is uh, extreme growth. Uh, we're looking at you know prices that should be sustained where they are and as I mentioned earlier, onto and beyond about $120 to $150 a kilo. Uh, just recently, we put out our ESG framework. Uh, this is something we, we plan to adhere to. Uh, we definitely will adhere to it. We developed this in conjunction with our PwC. Uh, so ESG, ec um, environment, social and governance. What are we gonna do? Uh, we're gonna look after the communities we involve, we're invested in. And we think Rare Earths has a, a significant role to play in the uh, decarbonisation that's going on in the world. And I think you've seen this thematic play out in a, in a very large way and we're we're very proud to be part of this, um, this revolution. Uh, we're adhering to the World Economic Forum principles. And those are that we, um, you know, we 
we behave ethically, we believe in the communities in which we operate, and we contribute to the decarbonisation of the world. It's worth mentioning, um, even before we signed up to our ESG framework, uh, we do contribute about 3.5% of our, our annual expenditure to the local community uh, through the Kimberley Sustainable Development Trust uh, to the benefit of the Jaru people. Uh, this, is, this is the people's land that we operate in the Kimberley. So we do believe and act um, in accordance with our, our ESG principles. Next slide. So onto the project itself, uh, where are we? We are in the uh, Kimberley region, as I mentioned, just south of Halls Creek. I've just come back from there uh, this morning, actually. It's uh, starting to get very warm up that part of the world, but uh, look, it's an area that uh, there is a lot of mining going on. Uh, you've got iron ore, uh, nickel, uh, gold mines as well. We're just off the town of my track. Uh, it's a very easy place to get around. Um, I can't see any impediments to getting on with what, what we're doing. Um, we, it's also worth mentioning in, in the north of Australia, you have a lot of, um, well, in Australia in general, in the critical mineral space, but also in the north of Australia, you have a lot of government incentives to develop these projects, um, the NAIF and the Critical Minerals Facilitation Office, et cetera. So as we progress through our uh, feasibility study, we will be leaning on these uh, departments to help us uh, fund our projects. So good news for shareholders that uh, we won't be, you know, Leaning on them for all the all the capital, we'll be leaning mostly on the government and um, the their, their pockets of funding that they provide. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned at the at the outset, uh, our resource uh, nineteen million tons. Uh, we're proud of the uh, the high grade portion. When we came into this project, we had a belief that there was a, a high grade component in the middle of this project, and we very much confirmed that with the drill bit last year. And then we've um, We've moved forward with that that uh, promise, and uh, we've come come to the we came to the view that there was a, a high grade primary part to this resource, and that's what we have been um, uh, drilling out over the last six months. And I'll talk about that in the next few slides. It's worth mentioning our basket price, as I said, uh, NDPR, terbium dysprosium are our main value drivers, and currently we're looking about a thirty four dollars per kilo uh, basket price for our rare earths. And it's also worth uh, mentioning the niobium. Niobium is a is a staggeringly consistent priced uh, commodity, uh, ninety three dollars a kilo. It's been like that for the last twenty years, and it could be a considerable um, value driver to our, pro our project as well. So, in terms of grade, where do we sit? Uh, I thought it's it's worth to mention why we're chasing that high grade core to our deposit. Uh, you look at the this graph of our competitors, you want to be on the left-hand side of that. At our, at our global resource, we sit in the middle of a pack, but I'm chasing the 2% the grade, which pushes us towards the left-hand side of that graph, which is where we want to sit. I think 2% is where you want to be to develop these projects, and that's very much what we're focused on with our exploration, and it's very much what we've achieved drilling out the oxide last year and what we are achieving drilling out the primary at the moment. Next slide, please. So the drilling we've been doing, uh, this is where we've been drilling. It's a carbonatite pipe. It's the same as Mount, well, very similar to Mount Weld. Um, it's not exactly the same, but it's very similar. It's a carbonatite intrusive. Uh, what we identified in the drilling is these high grade structures trending northwest, southeast. We think we've got a series of them in parallel. We're focused on the, the main fault at the moment. We are also planning to test the, uh, what we call the northern fault and the southern fault zone. Um, we have initially did 2,000 metres of RC drilling and now we're on the diamond drilling. Uh, we've just recently extended that program out till Christmas. The RC drill rig is also coming back uh, in the next couple of weeks to test some regional targets. So our plan with this drilling is to very much grow the, the resource and uh, we're doing that at the moment. Uh, we think we can move this thing up from a, a 20 million tonne resource up to a, a 30, 40, 50 million tonne resource with some good drilling. Next slide. So this drilling, this is what we've done. Uh, the 60, CRX 63 is what we um, drilled with the, with the RC. Very good results there, 40 metres at 2.4 and very excitingly 10 metres at 4.1. So they're, they're world-class results. Uh, CRX 11, uh, we announced is it's really hit the primary, that's with the, the diamond drill bit, and uh, we 
we announced recently, we've got over 20 metres of very high grade stuff uh, visually. That's in the lab. That'll be out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the planned hole on that graph, we've drilled that and we've got it again. We plan to step down again in the next in the coming weeks and, and try and target that primary mineralisation. So what you need to know about uh, Cummins Range is this isn't a, a, a story of the top 100 metres. This is a story of, of a carbonatite that stretches through 1,000 metres and we expect to continue to chase this high-grade mineralisation at depth. Next slide. This is that main fault in um, long section. This is to show the, the, the lateral extents. Uh, we, we believe it's there. Well, we don't believe it's there. We know it's there. We've seen it in that you can see it in those, those photos of the drill core. The top, the top photo there is the oxide and that's what it looks like in the primary below. So very exciting for us. Uh, we proved our theory and we're gonna to continue to grow the resource. Next slide. So our commercialization strategy, uh, well, how are we gonna get this thing to market? Uh, look, initially we focused on building a concentrate facility, building a, uh, producing a monazite con uh, concentrate and selling that to existing capacity in China. We then brought it our horizons to looking at the, the facilities that are going to be built in Australia and selling to them. And, and even further now, as we fully grow this resource, we're looking at uh, making our own carbonate facility on site, but we're still doing the, um, still, still doing the test work on that at the moment. So next slide, please. Uh, last of all, I'll advertise our Cosmos Exploration, our spin out. Uh, everyone's doing a spin out at the moment, but we think we've got a very good one here. We're focused on nickel copper gold exploration at our two uh, projects that weren't core to what uh, Rarex was doing in Rare S. Baro East, it's on the Western Nice terrain. It's, a, it's in a, a similar setting to uh, what's happening at Julemar with Chellis. And also Orange East, uh, just out of Orange on the east coast of Australia, is a, a porphyry copper gold hunt. Uh, Rarex will maintain about a 30% interest in the company and a 25% free carry in Orange East. We're not asking for it. We're asking for a very modest EV on this listing of 2 million, a bit of a different model to some of the other spin outs that are going on at the moment. We're raising 5 million. The IPO is live at the moment, uh, priority entitlement for Rarex shareholders and also a, a general offer to the public. So that, that's live at the moment. That'll um, finish uh, probably within a week from now. And look, we're excited by that as well. So last of all, why do you want to know about Rare Earths? We think we have a very good Rare Earth project in WA. Uh, we've recently proved our concept by almost doubling the resource. And look, we think we can double the resource again with what we're doing with the drill bit at the moment. And you put all that into a, a background of rare earth price and, and rare earth um, geopolitical tension and that, you know, very, very supportive environment for a, for a company like us. And last of all, have a look at our, our spin out Cosmos Exploration. Um, that IPO is underway. So yeah, very much uh, encourage you to take a look at, at rare X and also Cosmos Exploration. We think we have a compelling valuation proposition with only a 40 million market cap. A lot of our, um, peers in the space are, are tra trading around the 200 million. So yeah, we encourage you to take a look and uh, consider an investment in our company. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, we've got time for a couple of quick questions, if you don't mind. Um, so are there any um, major metallurgical issues arising from drilling at the moment, any radioactive elements? Uh, look, uh, look, our our deposit is a very low U uranium thorium monazite. Uh, monazites rare as uh, synonymous with having uh, radionuclides involved, uh, specifically thorium. If you look at rare as from the mineral sands industry, for example, they generally run about five six percent thorium, which is very very hot. <laughs> so out we we have, we run a low thorium monazite, probably fifty to hundred ppm. We also have about 50 to 100 ppm uh, uranium as well, but that doesn't come out in the product feed, so that just goes out to tails. So look, we're, we're comfortable with, with where we sit, and in fact, we think it's a benefit of our, of our project that it's, it's not, a, not a high radioactivity uh, uh, product in, in, this, in the scheme of what else what, what the others are producing. And um, there's a question here, at what, at what time will offtake partners become interested in the project? And if you look around the globe, you've got major producers in the US and Russia and China. Is, does Europe become a target market for you? And, and do you talk to, have you started conversations with the potential government funders there, the, the export credit agencies, et cetera? 
Uh, yeah, look, absolutely. We've, we've begun our discussions. Uh, we Initially, when I came to this business of rare earths, it was very much a China-focused story, but other markets have developed over the last two, three years. And yeah, absolutely, we're looking to North America, uh, Europe uh, to, to sell our product. Uh, the funders, yep, they're absolutely there as well. We have CAs with a, with a bunch of them. Um, we hope to include a transaction as we as we finalise our scoping study in the coming year. So yeah, very much we talk to those sort of parties. Right, thanks, Jeremy. Um, there's lots more questions which you could answer directly, or I can send those through to you on the weekend. We're, we're out of time, yep. but um, it'd be great to uh, for you to answer some of those questions at some stage. I, I'm, so I certainly will. Thanks very much. Right, thank you. Uh, next up, we have Straker Translations, uh, ASX code STG, market cap of 118 million, one year return of uh, around 83%. Uh, the company aims to empower people around the world to communicate openly, uh, protect unique cultures, enable the free flow of ideas, information, entertainment, and commerce. We have with us CEO Grant Straker. Grant, over to you, mate. Hi, Tim. Thank you very much for that. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So, yes, as uh, Tim said, look, we operate in a uh, multi-billion dollar industry, around about 50 billion US dollars. Uh, we're a, fundamentally a technology company that has built technology and a business model to disrupt that industry. So, next slide, please. Uh, taking a bit of time. There we go. So um, I'll start off with just saying, you know, what is it that we do? So we built some technology um, that enables uh, humans and machines together to basically improve the productivity of translators and the translation process. And the outcome of that is that we drive higher margins. Um, We've built up now to around about 240 staff uh, around the world in eight countries. Uh, we've got a, a very significant enterprise uh, base, customer base. 10% uh, of our revenue is SaaS based revenue. Um, and, and we've given guidance this year of uh, $50 million in revenue up from um, 32 last year. So quite significant growth. Um, that, that we're forecast uh, and, and achieving at the moment. So uh, next slide, please. So a little bit about the industry. So if you look at this slide, you know, as I said, it's 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 a 50 odd billion dollar industry. Now, if you compare that to the music industry, it's, it's three times the size of the music industry. It's four times the size of the cloud computing industry and two thirds the size of the global fitness industry and it's a hugely fragmented industry with um, 20,000 smaller cottage industry type, type players and the top three only make up 4% and the top 100 only 18%. So it's really ripe for disruption and, and our big focus has been on using our technology to, uh, to, to, to be able to get to these customers that are now looking to change the way in which they do localization. Um, and, and all of the ways that they facilitate global trade. Um, <clears throat> and that, that's certainly um, something we're achieving at the moment. So next slide. So as I said, we, we have technology and, and I don't want to show you lots of um, you know, shiny, shiny buttons when I can show you the outcome of that technology. And, and that is fundamentally that we make significantly higher margins than the industry average. Industry averages are about 40%. We're making 57%. Um, and the other part of our technology was that this year we were uh, chosen as a uh, primary global supplier for IBM off the back of our technology. And that's a really significant uh, deal that I'm going to talk about shortly. But that was because we can achieve things with our technology that others cannot. Um, and, and we're now starting to see that um, get leveraged into a, a range of other larger enterprise customers. So next slide, please. So here's our um, growth trajectory. So we IPO'd in 2018, revenues around about 25 million. We had a couple of uh, steady growth years, but, it, but our, our idea was always with the funds that we raised at the IPO for that, we, we raised about 20, uh, 25 million, was for that to get us to 
50 million in revenue. And that would give us the size and the scale from which we can then start to really approach and try and um, drive up towards an aspirational target of 100 million in revenue. And you can see um, a couple of years of steady growth and then one year of big growth. And that gr big year of growth is driven off 50% uh, of it through acquisition and 50% of it organically. So, um, you know, if you look at this chart um, and, and the revenue numbers I'm talking about, I know that when you look at our revenue multiple to market cap compared to many other technology companies, um, it's fair to say that we are certainly, um, you know, at the lower end of, of those multiples, despite the fact that we, um, you know, have such a, a great growth rate off the back of our technology. So next slide, please. So to talk about IBM, um, so we closed a four-year deal. Uh, they went from 20 suppliers down to one, which is us. Um, they were a customer of ours for Spanish. They used to spend about a million dollars a year with us in Spanish. Uh, the new deal gives us 55 languages and, and about 10 to 12 of them are the same type of volume as, as Spanish. So quite a significant deal. And, and the really big takeaway from this was that this was the first time that a really significant global user of translation services had decided to choose a disruptive player over one of the really large legacy incumbents. Okay, so it was a really good sign of one, what our technology can do, and two, how uh, buyers in the industry are thinking about their vendors going forward. So, um, you know, great uh, proof around our technology. Next slide. Uh, the other thing that we did in the year was we acquired a company, we acquired a company in January called Lingotech, had around about 11 million of revenue, 5 million of that was SaaS. Uh, they've brought on board about 20 new enterprise customers. And we very much have a land and expand type philosophy. So our idea is that these guys had a good technology base, which had hooked in a number of customers. They're in the US, around about 50 staff, uh, an area that we wanted to grow in. Um, and now we're able to get into some of their really significant customers and start to grow the translation services base because these guys actually just had the SaaS platform in there. And, it, and our platform is very, very good at giving productivity gains. And they had basically a bunch of connectors which help connect internal content systems into um, translation management systems such as our Ray platform. Uh, next customer, uh, next slide, please. <coughs> So um, as I just talked about, one of our big aims is to increase the customer wallet, one of our big organic growth opportunities. And you can see right across a range of sectors, we have really some significant customers. And as I said before, we've gone from a million dollars, one language with IBM to 55 languages. But we also have really significant customers right across the group. We don't do all of the work for them. And we're now starting to get into a situation where they are looking to consolidate vendors and we see some really significant growth opportunities. So you can just see from the amount of um, logos we have on there and and, um, and the quality of them that we are in a very strong position for that organic growth. Uh, next slide, please. So over the last um, uh, few years, we have made a number of acquisitions. And again, this is part of the land and expand. It's not a consolidation. It's not just about saying we're going to buy a company um, and just grow for the sake of growing. It's about saying we're going to buy a company as we did with MSS in Spain that have IBM as a customer. We're going to again get into IBM, show them how we can grow and, um, and, and move forward. Um, and you can see um, as we've acquired companies, even at the Lingo Tech, they have Nike and Oracle, uh, for example, as customers. So next slide, please. So just on the last couple of slides, this is about our aspirational target and and what we're showing here is that we, if you look at the analyst forecast we're around about break even this year uh, for a tech company i think that that's um unusual as most are generally um making really significant losses so we're around about break even with with, with sort of 60 percent growth if you look at that going forward as we grow now we don't expect our opex to significantly increase we expect our margins to say the same and we raised uh, 24 million dollars uh, two months ago to help fund the next level of growth to get us to 75 million and that'll be a mixture of organic and acquisitive growth and you can start to see uh, the white bit there which is ebitda started to get produced so we're right at that pivot point where we really start to create a uh, significant value for our shareholders as we start to grow but also deliver some 
some EBIT, but EBITDA. Now, these are not, there was not a timeline on this. These are not financial years. These are milestones. So um, we're not saying that there's a, a timeline to get here. We've raised the capital. We've got all the um, right building blocks, and this is where we go. And again, if you can see at 100 million, uh, OPEX again doesn't increase that much. Margin stays the same, and we start to get uh, some really significant EBITDA. So next slide, please. And so just a final slide summary. Look, we have growth on par with, with the leading sort of tech unicorns in the ASX. And, um, you know, a, a, a big chunk of uh, difference between, uh, you know, where a lot of those are trading and where we trade. And I think that presents an opportunity for, for shareholders. Uh, industry leading margins, proving our technology, uh, you know, massive win with IBM, um, which isn't just about tech, but it's about our ability to sell and get into these large enterprises with our enterprise sales teams. Uh, we're investing quite heavily at the moment in, in growing more of those types of salespeople. Uh, we've got some very active m a on the go at the moment. So um, again, we've raised the capital, have a strong balance sheet to execute, and we're in an inflection point where OPEX is going to stay steady -ish in terms of growth rate, and um, uh, we, we can see some, some, um, you know, some really good opportunities uh, for, for growing the value for our shareholder base. So um, yeah, thank you, Tim. Thanks, Grant. That's really interesting. I mean, it's I'm totally surprised at the size of the industry. I mean, it makes sense. Can you can you can you talk through your your, your kind of average customer and, and what they actually use you for in terms of translation? Yeah, look, there's all sorts. So there's a company called Stretch Creative, which is a US company, for example. They use us for they do content creation creation into multiple languages for for large sort of Fortune 500 type companies, and they use us to, to streamline that process. A uh, Japanese company called Mitutoyo sell um, micrometers and engineering equipment into Europe. So they sell into 20 countries and they put out a, their latest specials and offers every month on the website and on brochures. And they, so they use us to do that into 20 languages. So that soon add up, adds up to be quite significant. And then you have all of the legal firms, all of that, that type of work that goes on. Um, manufacturing is, is a big sector for us. Um, a lot of manufacturers, obviously product manuals, uh, automobile manufacturers, for example. So a really diverse um, customer base. We are strong in a couple of verticals. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's just an enormous industry um, ripe for um, the picking. Yeah, fascinating. And and your growth through acquisition. When you when you look for an acquisition, is that to have complementary tech, or is that to buy a, a client base? Uh, that's to actually buy. Um, it's not so much to buy a client base. It's actually to buy the customer, and then so to buy the business, improve the margins, use our tech, so we can move from forty to fifty seven percent, saying gross margin, or get an uplift, so you you make them more profitable. And then you get into that customer base and you want to grow them. So Linger Tech was a bit more tech, but also customer. But really, we're looking for, um, you know, legacy players who don't have the tech, don't have that ability, but but have these strong relationships. And and can you talk about how competitive it is in, in this industry at the moment, whether it's kind of small tech startups or the likes of Facebook? How, how, how competitive is it? And is there the risk one of these big guys kind of invests heavily and, and gobbles you up or gobbles the industry up? Oh, look, the big guys uh, don't have really much interest in, in, in doing the type of, of, of stuff that we're doing. I mean, it's, that's, that's been an argument, I think, or a conversation going around for about 10 years. They've never done it <clears throat> um, because they don't want to be involved in the services industry. They want to be involved in consumer facing, low touch type stuff. Right? So, you, you know, your mass Google Translate give you the context type of stuff. Yes, they don't want to get involved in managing complex projects around um, healthcare or medical devices, right? It's, it's a whole different game. Um, uh, in terms of the tech startups, so again, you, you can't win and you're not going to win on a small scale. I mean, if I look at IBM, it takes massive production teams. There's still lots of integration. It's not something a small startup can come up with some little uh, widget and think they're going to win. You, you've got to really be a significant services organization. And that's where we've focused differently to others. We've built the tech team, which is about 50, but we've also built a global services to deliver, to give a channel for our innovation. And is, and is there any human intervention in terms of the, the translation process? 
Uh, yes, there is absolutely. So it's machine, and then it's it's humans. I'm, I'm just just saw the question there about liquidity. Uh, what what are the plans to improve liquidity? Well, we're coming on the share cafe for a start. Uh, no, one of the reasons is I don't think we're perceived as a, as a technology company enough, and so we're doing lots of um, we've done we did a tech webinar last week actually, which um, showcased our tech and our, how our clients use it. So I think as the market starts to understand more of our technology, they'll start to really understand, um, you know, and, and see the value. I think that's one of the reasons, and, and that's yeah. And and I mean, lower volume is always associated with a, a register that's well held, held by founders and institutions. Can you talk us through the register? Sure. Yep. Yeah. So um, again, if you want to follow some some really um, strong leaders on this, so, so you've got uh, Oz Ethical just become a substantial um, shareholder. Climb have become a substantial shareholder in the last sort of six months as we've done a capital raise and other stuff. Then you've got uh, Baylor um, ex All Black Captain David Kirk's um, fund. They're a substantial shareholder. Um, you know, my family substantial shareholder. So, so um, yeah, there, there, it is it is tightly held, and I think um, you know w w w everything we can do. I think as we start to um, people start to see us win. I mean, I'm just. It's a great believer you deliver the results. We, we sat there for a long time saying, look, we're going to win a really significant deal off the back of our tech and the market wasn't sure. When we delivered IBM, they suddenly went, actually, these guys were telling the truth. They are, they are doing it. And when we say we've now got the 75 million and 100 million target, I think people can start to see that we have a clear pathway to get there. Yeah, thanks, Grant. I'm a really interesting story. We can always help you with liquidity, um, and we'd like to talk to you, <laughs> we'd like to talk to you again. So, um, thanks for your time. Enjoy your week. No worries. No worries. Thanks, Dan. Cheers. No worries. See you later. Uh, next up, we have Los Cerros Limited, ASX code L uh, LCL, market cap around eighty six million dollars. Stocks had a one year return of minus twenty percent. The company is committed to explore, develop, and operate mining projects within world-class mineral provinces with a focus on copper and gold. We have with us uh, Jason Sturbinski, um, Sturbinskis, sorry, um, who is the managing director. Jason, thanks for your time. Over to you. Thanks, Tim, and, and thanks everyone for um, for tuning in and, and showing some interest in the company. Uh, as Tim mentioned, we are focused on gold and, and to some degree copper, but uh, the main story is the gold we have in Colombia in two major districts. Uh, next slide, please. Please go to any of our, um, okay, we've just passed that one. Please go to any of our um, presentations or announcements for the usual forward-looking statements and, um, and uh, competent person statements, et cetera. Now, we recently welcomed two North American institutions to our register. These were um, global significant institutions, both wanting 5% uh, or just under 5%. And uh, so that was a month and a half ago, two months ago. And we also uh, welcomed uh, additional shareholders to raise a total of 20 plus million dollars at that time. So we're well funded right now. Our number one shareholder is Lizzing Pty Ltd. Uh, which um, uh, many might know as, as Dr. Fu's company. Uh, Bullet Holding Corporation at 4%, that's a well-established Colombian uh, exploration house. It's been in country for four decades or so. And Anglo Gold Ashanti is the only um, uh, major um, producer on our register or in the top 20 of our register at 1.67%. And that was the result of uh, dissolving a joint venture with Anglo Gold Ashanti to acquire their position in one of the assets called Chuskel. And in exchange for that, uh, they took a position in Los Cerros. Next slide, please. So we sit on the mid Colca porphyry belt. That's that yellow colored strip running north south in Colombia. And that extends on further down through much of South America. And uh, if you can name a, a gold project in Colombia, chances are it sits on that mid Colca porphyry belt from Buritica in the north. Uh, through to La Colosa in the south and some truly massive uh, projects in that area. Now we hold two uh, projects, uh, the Andes project, which is the much larger of the two projects, but uh, much more earlier stage, and the Kinchia project, which has been the, the major focus of our um, efforts for the last 18 months, and some, um, some discoveries there and some successes there has been the driver of our share price and, and market cap, and of course that recent capital raise. Next slide, please. 
Uh, now, I put this slide in for those people who are coming in new to our story. This is a summary of some of the more significant drill results and really just want to focus on gram meters to show that we have a very significant number of globally significant intercepts and they're not just dedicated to one, dis one discovery there across Tesserito, Miraflores, Dos Cabratus and so on. And some of these are truly significant, 629 metres at 088 for a gram metres intercept of 553 metres uh, was one that we drilled earlier this year. And that, along with the fourth one down, which was also in uh, January of this year, 320 metres at one and a half gram per tonne, uh, essentially from surface as well. Uh, those two uh, earlier this year sat in the top 10 drill results for any company on the ASX for a good five months or so. Um, they, they've now fallen off that top 10, but that gives you an idea of how significant those results are. Uh, but they're just two of, of many very significant results we have across the project area. Uh, next slide, please. So let's focus now on Kinshia. This is where the, the main activity has been. Uh, next slide, please. It's a cluster of uh, targets and um, discoveries uh, in about a three kilometre radius uh, centred on Miraflores, which is an established reserve. It's a sub half million ounce reserve, grading 3.3 gram per tonne. Uh, in the north, we have targets like Dos Cabrada, Santa Sofia and Los Loma, and there's a few others up there as well, uh, earlier stage that we're um, progressing. Uh, but the main focus has been to the south of Miraflores with three um, areas, Tesserito, Sebal and Chuscal, which all kind of anchor themselves to the um, Mamato Fault Corridor, which seems to be a major sort of pathway for, for mineralisation in the area. Uh, next slide, please. These are the financials of the Miraflores DFS back in 2017. And you can see... Um, at $1,400 US an ounce, so not today's gold prices, but at $1,400 US an ounce, and an NPV of 8%, so a reasonably conservative NPV position. Uh, it's, it's a reasonably good uh, project in terms of its economics, uh, running at a 90 million NPV. And of course, in today's gold prices, it would be, um, well, you'd hope it would be um, better than that. Uh, but that's not the main story, even though we have a reserve there and it's going through the final stages of submissions for, for approvals. Uh, the main story is the fact that this sits in a in a much larger area with multiple discoveries, and in particular Tesserito, which is um, less than one kilometre away. That's been where we've had the, the bulk of the recent success, and um, calculating a, a maiden resource there is on our work plan. Next slide, please. So this is Tesserito. Um, we uh, the first drill, drill hole we drilled at uh, Tesserito under new management. Um, um, in 2020, sort of late quarter three, 2020, was that third hole down in that table there, um, hole number eight, 230 metres at a gram per tonne. And that really changed the trajectory of Los Cerros. Um, 18 months ago, we were sub two cents and market cap of seven mil. And now we're bouncing around 14, 15 cents and um, 80 some million and on the radar of some of the biggest uh, precious metal funds in the world. So uh, it's been a, an amazing 18 month journey. But what I really want to point out on, in Tesserito, which is a near surface or at surface um, gold porphyry, is um, two things. First of all, if you look at those drill intercepts in that table, they are all sort of 200 and 300 metre intercepts grading a gram per tonne, some of them significantly better than that. And that's in itself is, is quite spectacular. But what's really spectacular and quite unique for, for Tesserito is a lot of those are sitting on the surface. Just look at that from um, row there or column there, and you can see that almost all the intercepts that um, we've uh, reported from Tesserito start on the surface. So we have a gold porphyry sitting on the surface, grading a gram per tonne, and in some areas grading even better than that. Uh, there's a few holes worthy of pointing out. Um, hole 14, you can see there is, is highlighted. Uh, that was the one that I mentioned earlier, uh, running at one and a half grams per tonne, with a large section of that running at two grams per tonne. Uh, hole 16, two holes down from that. That's the, the one that looks a little unusual. You can see most of the drill results there reporting 200 to 300 metre intercepts, some slightly larger. And this one is, is over 600 metres long. And the reason for that is, is quite interesting uh, and set us on a path of discovering or, or better understanding the regional structure here. Hole 16, and you, you might be able to make it out on the map there, drilled essentially across the, the main sort of um, diameter of, of Tesserito South. 
But rather than stopping drilling at the um, the secondary fault you can see running from top of image to bottom of image on the uh, on the left hand side or the western side, we continued drilling past that typical or usual endpoint for another several hundred meters, and we hit another porphyry, another porphyry pulse of of, um, of interest. And that's why um, hole 16 is, is you know, nearly double the length of everything else because we actually went through a second porphyry pulse at depth. And now we've called that Tesserito West and we look forward to progressing that uh, further in the near term. And the other group of results that I think are, are quite interesting and, and um, um, look, uh, something that's gonna really drive our, our future drilling program is the, the last few holes we've put out. So holes 24, 25, 26, uh, 29 and 30. And yeah, 29 and 30. Uh, they are all uh, were, were, were the intention of testing the outer limits of the mineralization. So they weren't in the main body of Tesserito South. They were trying to find the edges and they're delivering some of the most spectacular results we've got so far, suggesting that those drill holes, and they all kind of radiate from one um, drill pad you can see on the, uh, the right hand side of that image. Uh, that um, the high grade sort of central zone of the porphyry hits the surface there. Uh, and so most of the drilling over the, the last nine months has really been in this sort of southern area, not uh, sort of covering the whole sort of circumference of the, the potential area of mineralization, which begs the question, well, what's to the north and what's to the northeast? And that's where we've been drilling at the moment, pushing further in that direction. Uh, we have three drill rigs uh, drilling in the north and we also have one uh, drilling in the south along a very broad front because it, open, it remains open uh, to the south as well. It's also slightly open to the east. As you can see, there's a few arrows there pointing to the east as well. But we do know when we hit the Marmoto Fault, uh, as you can see on that image there, uh, that's that's the end of it. So there is potential to grow the envelopes in that direction, but we do know there, there is a limit um, ultimately with the Marmoto Fault. Next slide, please. So this is a cross section, looking at the one on the right first. This is a cross section describing essentially what I was just talking about. So you can see on the, the right hand side, the big Mamoto fault gray lines that kind of define the, the eastern edge and that secondary fault defining the, um, the western edge. And you can see their hole 16, which drilled through the, the body of the um, Tesserito South target area, went past that secondary fault and kept on going into, a, into another porphyry uh, pulse. Now that led us to, um, develop a, a regional theory that's um, gaining more traction as we learn more. And that is that Tesserito South is actually part of a larger system, a nested porphyry system. And that leads me to that image in the on the left hand side there. You can see Tesserito South, uh, that football on the on the right hand side of that image. Uh, that's where all that drilling's been. So 35 plus holes drilling in that area, defining Tesserito South. And then occasionally we've done deeper holes and gone in through um, Tesserito West in that second circle there. Now, a kilometre away or slightly under a kilometre away is Miraflores, the established reserve. Now, that's not a porphyry, that's a breccia pipe. Uh, presumably the, the source of that or the cause of that is a porphyry somewhere, but no one's ever found the porphyry. And um, this um, theory, this regional um, uh, model, uh, gives some weight to where that porphyry source might be, and it might be this central zone, and therefore Tesserito South and Miraflores are essentially bookends of a much larger system in which we also see Tesserito West and this um, central target. And there is some evidence on surface, as you can see there, to suggest there is something going on at depth there. We've just completed a uh, deep penetrating IP and a drone mag survey over this area. And we expect that to, to highlight what's going on in this area uh, ahead of uh, drilling these target areas. Next slide, please. Uh, Sebal, I, I put this one in the pack because it um, has a lot of similarities to Tesserito. We, we hope it follows a super uh, a similar trajectory to Tesserito. It sits on the same sort of uh, structural address. So it sits on a north-south fault uh, with a northwesterly sort of lineament cutting through it. And you see that's a common trend in all the big, big discoveries of the mid Kolka belt from um, Burutika um, south. Uh, we've drilled and re released two results here, a 500 metre long hole and a 586 metre long hole, both delivering half a gram per tonne. Uh, now that's the entire length of the hole. So both of those holes were that length and delivered half a gram per ton. We do have some assays pending here as well. We should um, be able to say something to the market about those uh, relatively soon about how um, Sebal is, is developing. But uh, just nine months ago, this was one soil sample on the surface and, and that's it. 
So we've fast-tracked this through, given that it uh, has a very appealing structural address to, to find a porphyry. Uh, next slide, please. So that's the Kinchia project, three kilometre radius of a number of, of targets, some very advanced and others that I haven't even talked about uh, uh, in the area. Now onto the Andes project. Next slide, please. As I said, this is the much larger area, but much more sort of um, green field. We have taken 14,000 surface samples here, and that's helped us define uh, a great number of targets, uh, a lot of uh, epithermal high-grade gold, um, silver, lead, zinc type um, targets, and a few porphyry targets as well. And um, uh, massive area. You can see there's this northwesterly orientation here, which seems to sort of drive or guide mineralization through the whole of the mid coker and it's, it's no different here as well. Uh, we have done some drilling here uh, and um, had some reasonably interesting results from that drilling, but it's, it's mostly um, uh, greenfield targets that we hope to get to, if not late this year, then 2022. Next slide, please. So uh, why Los Cerros? Well, hopefully I've already convinced you just by talking about Tesserito and the, and the potential we have there. But let's go on and we'll talk about the rest of the project pipeline. So this is relatively unique uh, for a junior to have such a significant project pipeline. We are not reliant on one project or one target to, to deliver. Uh, we've got a reserve at Miraflores. And as I said, that's going through final submissions. We have a resource at Dos Cabradas. I haven't even talked about that one, but that's within the Kinchia project as well to the north uh, west of Miraflores. Uh, we have drilling or, or we are drilling at Cebal, at Chuscal, at El Columpio, which is one of the, the Andes projects, and at Tesserito. Uh, we um, are primed to drill at, uh, at San Pablo when we choose to. And then there's a number of other targets uh, in the uh, sort of drill ready or uh, preparation stages, which are just waiting either final approvals to be able to drill there or just some surface work before we, before we drill at those. And then, of course, we've got the target um, generation area, 90% uh, of the Andes portfolio we haven't even walked over yet, and we have a great number of targets at Kinchia to develop as well to keep this project pipeline moving. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so very briefly onto our ESG credentials. Uh, we do a, um, work to uh, the um, sustainable development goals and we've structured that around um, a meaningful sort of set of criteria that are particularly relevant to us. These are from our 2020 reporting. So you can see we invest quite heavily in local programs and then the community. At the moment, it says 59 employees there, but at the moment we, we have about 100 because we're so active in the field. And of those 100 employees, 98 of them are Colombians. And so we're very much, and the vast majority of those live in uh, Kinchia in the local town. So we're very much ingrained in the local community and in the local economy. Next slide, please. That's pretty very important uh, in the last sort of 18 months as the world's been grappling with uh, COVID. Uh, fortunately, uh, with the success we've had at the drill bit and the fact that we are very well funded, we've been able to um, invest very heavily in employment with, with people in local communities that have lost their normal employment through COVID. And we've been able to bring them on in, in sampling teams and similar. So uh, it's been a great opportunity for us uh, to, to see beyond um, what we usually do and how we usually operate and employ a large number of people and, and help uh, Colombia, in particular, Kinshia in that area, um, navigate this, um, this terrible virus. So that's, that's um, the end of the presentation. Next, next slide, please, just the, the closing slide. So we have four drill rigs running at the moment. We have flagged the intention of a fifth rig. We are very well funded. We have a dedicated project uh, target generation team. So we've got targets on the horizon that hopefully will go through that system as well. And uh, with all that uh, activity, um, hopefully 2022 will be just as exciting as 2021. And thanks for your interest. Great, thanks, Jason. Uh, we've got time for some questions. We've got a couple of questions I'd suggest from shareholders here and then a couple uh, in more general. Um, now, you, you touched on this, but can you give us some more colour on the current standing of backlog assay results and how many are still sitting in the labs? Yeah, it's it's been a, a difficult problem for us. Uh, well, not unique to us. COVID has made a mess of the whole assay uh, industry at the moment. So uh, we're struggling with that as well. So we put out three results last week. Uh, from Tesserito, and I believe there's probably another 10 uh, assay, assays pending. Uh, we did, we have been working with the lab um, to try and break that backlog, and uh, we expect a, uh, the, the pace of uh, assay turnaround to be much quicker now, but at the moment it's sort of like 12 weeks now. 
And and Jason Anglo Gold have a, a, an option expiring very soon. Do, do you know their intentions? Whether they'll exercise that? I think it's out of the money anyway. I don't know their intentions. No, and that was part of the deal to acquire their portion of Trust Gold. But I, I haven't don't know their intentions. No. Sure. Now, um, Colombia in general has made a lot of uh, progress security wise. Um, are your discoveries in a secure area? And can you give us a little bit more colour on? Um, what impact COVID's had on your, on your current and uh, near-term work activity? Yeah, both the Andes and the Kinchia projects are in, in reasonably safe areas. Uh, the, the areas that are still remain a bit of a problem are mainly sort of in the, on the Pacific coast. Um, as you know, four or five years ago, maybe even six now, there was a peace accord signed with the FARC, which ended the, the formal conflict in Colombia. And so it's a much safer place now and has been for, for many years now, as evidenced by the number of majors that uh, are our neighbours now. Uh, the risk profile meets meets their criteria now, as maybe it didn't uh, before. So our areas, um, yeah, are safe to be, and I certainly don't have any concerns when I'm in those areas. In terms of COVID, yeah, Colombia is, is really struggling with um, with COVID. They have had a very aggressive vaccination program, and that's starting to to show benefits now. So uh, we are seeing bite at the end of the tunnel there. Uh, in terms of Kinchia, where most of the team is based. That we're very fortunate. That is uh, in the Andes Mountains, and it's at the end of a road, so it's no through traffic. If you're on that road, chances are you're going to Kinchia, and so it's been very well, relatively easy to control uh, the local town and COVID in the local town. Uh, we've also had a very wide uh, vaccination program that's gone beyond our team. So um, we've we've had vaccinations go out into the community as well, and we have very strict COVID rules um, inside the company as well. Uh, so in terms of the impact it's had on us, we we experience it when we need to bring materials in. So when we had to um, bring materials in from the port or similar, then we, we notice it. But in terms of our day-to-day -day operations, other than uh, protocols, it hasn't really affected our operations. And um, as a technical question here, does the terrain uh, lend itself for low overburden rates or are these resources sitting on the, the, the flank of a mountain? Mm, well, it's a bit of both. So Miraflores, which is the, the established reserve, that's on the side of a mountain, not particularly high um, elevations. We sort of bounce around 800 to sort of 1600, 1800 elevations. So nothing particularly uh, remarkable there, but it is on the side. And the that modelling of the DFS is an underground in part because it's on, on the side of a mountain. Tesserito is on a, what's the best word, probably a sub-valley. So it's not the valley valley as such where the mid Coco River is. It's on a sort of a, a, a plateau area, probably 800, 1,000 RL and relatively flat. So uh, compared to the Andes Mountains. So uh, that does lend itself to you know, a potential uh, bulk mining. And, and Jason, finally, there's the question here from one of the brokers. Um, what's your opinion on the gold price? It's been under pressure. <laughs> Um, what do you think will be the catalyst for resume buying interest in gold in the next 12 months? I always want to know your forecasts. I know you're not, you don't have a crystal ball there, but they'd appreciate an opinion from an expert. <laughs> Look, I, I've given up many years ago trying to predict where the gold price is going to go. I, I defer to people far more informed than I am. But um, I, I look at the amount of money that's being produced and um, the sort of global uncertainties around and you've, you've got to think it's got to be strong, right, in the next few years. So uh, I know that's not particularly sophisticated, uh, but uh, that's how I see things. That I can't, I can see plenty of reasons for it being where it is now and being stronger. See very few for it going down. And you're very well positioned in that regard. So, Jason, thanks for your time. Have a nice weekend, and, and love to hear the get an update on the story uh, probably early next year. Thanks for your interest. Bye. That's all we have time for. Thanks for your time. On Tuesday, there's that due diligence webinar on uh, Magnus Energy Technologies. Watch out for that. That's our new series, single company webinar. See you again next week.